In this video, we're going to see an example of how we can solve a maze using Java. Now, there's a lot of options for how to do this. And the first thing we want to think about is how do we represent a maze so that our program can read that maze and know what the maze looks like. So the way we're going to represent a maze is with a file. That file is going to have in its first line the dimensions of the maze, and those could be any values. So this is a five by five maze. Then it's going to have one entry for each location in the maze, and that'll be one if it's an available open place that the that you can go in the maze. And if it's a blocked area, it will be zero. So this file represents this maze. And so you can see, for example, this is open and the corresponding value is right here. Here you can see there's four open spots in a row that corresponds to these four spots here. Here we have three block locations in a row. That's these locations here. So hopefully you can see how those two things correspond to each other. This is actually the first thing you have to understand before we move on to actually solving the maze. So in our main method, we're going to set up where to look for the maze files. So here it's we're using a relative path so that this will work no matter where you have this repository. It'll look in source, video examples, module four, recursion, maze tester recursive. And you can see we have three maze files. And those have pretty much the same format. This is the one we just saw. It's very simple. We have a more complicated one here and an even more complicated one here. Actually, I guess these are equally complicated. This one's a little easier because you'll notice there's wide gaps of open spaces. So in our main method, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prompt the user for the name of the file. And we're going to use the name of that file as a parameter to the constructor for our maze object. Now, the maze object itself isn't going to solve. Again, that maze object just represents the maze. We're going to have another class called maze solver that its constructor takes a maze as a parameter and it'll actually solve that. It has a traverse method that will return a Boolean whether or not the maze was traversed. Let's take a look at our maze class and you can see that there's three constants, open, tried, and path. So zero means it's blocked. Open means is one and that's what we would see in the file. And then we're going to update as we go through the maze once we try a location, we'll mark it as tried with the number two. And when we when we found the solution, we'll backtrack our path and, and set those to be three so that our output will actually have a three in the successful path. And I'll actually show you what this looks like before we go on. So let's just start with test file text because that's the simplest one. And you can see this is that maze we saw before, but if you see three, 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 that's the path that's this, that solves that maze. So it's this right here. Three, 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 three. So we have some members for the number of rows, the number of columns. We have an in row in column, and that's the coordinates of where the maze ends. And then we'll have a two dimensional array to actually hold the value. So the, this grid actually holds the maze. So the constructor is going to go through and read in the number of rows from the first line, and then using the those values as a row count and column count for the maze. And then in our for loop, I'm going to go through and read those values one by one until I've read the entire maze. And in this case, I'm going to set the end row to just that bottom right corner, but there's no reason to do this. You could actually set these values to whatever you want, or they could be a parameter. So I have some methods here, and these are just to allow the solver to write code that, that is clear. So instead of the solver having to say grid row column is equal to tried, we have a method that says try position, takes a row and a column, and it sets that row and column to tried. And we have a Boolean for solved that returns solved if the row and column are the end row and column. Again, this is this way, it simplifies the code in the solver class to do that sort of thing. We have a getter for the rows and the number of columns. We have a mark path, which is going to be called at the end. Again, we mark the path of a row and column that sets those that location in the grid to be the path value. And that that's that's the three we saw that indicates this location is part of the path from the beginning to the end. And then finally, to check that a position is valid, 
we pass in a row and column. And the first thing we check is that the row and the column are actually valid values. It's actually on the matrix. It's not less than zero. It's not greater than the number of rows or the number of columns, depending on what we're looking at. And if that's true, then we look to see, is that location open? We haven't tried it and it's not blocked. If that's, tr if that, if that's the case, we return turn true. Otherwise we return false. And then finally, we have a two string method that just prints the string. And I think that that should be pretty clear what's going on there. We have two for loops that go through and print every row and column. Okay, so you may think writing a maze, none of this is really complicated Java code. The, the thought behind it, sure, yeah, that, that could be. But the code itself is pretty straightforward, right? It, it's two dimensional arrays, but really once you get beyond that, everything is pretty straightforward, right? This is a simple compound comparison, getters and setters. This just takes a row and column and sets that value. Nothing really too complicated. Now you may think, well, a maze has to be really complicated to solve, but notice the maze solver is again, if you've seen the Towers of Hanoi example, just like that, it's really short. It's the, you shouldn't expect it to be this short. Uh, this is a really powerful program for how little code there actually is. And all of the logic to solve that is here. So our maze solver is gonna have a maze as a data member. And then we have this traverse method. The traverse method is gonna take a row and column. And if you'll remember, when we call this, we start off with zero, zero. And we check to see, is this a valid position? Now, if it's not, we return done. There's nothing to do. And notice we initialize done to false. Otherwise, we mark that we've tried this position. So that way we won't call it again. And, and remember, if we've tried a position, it's no longer a valid position. So we won't try any position more than once. So then we see, okay, are we at the end of the maze? If we are, we set done to true. And again, you'll notice if we're done, we mark the path. Now, if we're not at the end, notice what we do. If we're not done, we look to the location above. If we're not done then, we look to the location to the left. If, the, if we're not done then, we look to the location down. And then finally, if, that, if we still haven't solved the maze, we look to the right. Keep in mind, each time you call one of these methods, you're going to travel a long way, possibly, right? You may go up, and then once you've called this, you're in a different location, so you'll go up from there, up from there, up from there, and then you'll go left from there, and so forth. Keep in mind that this isn't just checking four spots. You're actually going to say, try to find the solution to the maze going to this location or from this location. This isn't just four calls. You're going to have a lot of recursive calls here where this traverse calls a traverse, which calls another traverse, and so on. So there's a lot of times that these get called, but notice once it's done, no matter where, where this row and column is, if we found the solution here, then we mark that as being on the path. So if we go back to our maze example, if we go back to our maze example, you can see, let's say that we're here. Well, now we're done. And now we're going to return from to here. This is now done. So it's going to put a three here and it's going to basically return along the path that's the solution it's going to find a solution go to the end and then it's going to backtrack marking each location as part of the path how does it do that well because from here it called try location to the right and from here it called try location to the to down now here i think we go up left and then down so it would have called this and this but not found a solution and so it would have gone down and, and so on so if you want to try to do a short maze, you may want to trace this out in pen and paper to help understand it, because there's a lot of things happening here that can be difficult to track in your mind. Once we've done that, we return done, and that's our maze. This amount of code is all the logic it takes to go through every location in a maze. And you also may notice these methods, even though these some of these methods don't, don't do a lot, they still, by having methods, we can give them names that make it clear what's going on. We check to see if something's valid. If it's a valid position, then we try it. And then we check to see have we solved the maze now. And if not, then we do a traversal uh, from one of the neighbors. And of course, if none of these are done, done remains false. And so I return false from here saying, hey, don't even try searching down this path because there's nothing here. I can't get to the end from my location. So let's try the other two examples. 
So test file2.txt, you'll notice there is no possible path. There's a lot of twos and, and some ones, so that means you can't even get to those ones. And then let's try test file 3. And there we do find a solution. And one thing you may notice is, like for example, right here and right here, there's a lot of threes together. It's not an optimal path it's finding. It's just saying, hey, if you go here and then go here and then go here, you get to the solution. It's not trying to find shortcuts or anything like that. That would be some optimizations that you would want to put on after you were done. But it does find a solution. Eventually, you get to where we're saying the goal is. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to how you can solve mazes using recursion in Java. One thing to keep in mind as we go forward, because recursion uses the call stack, you can actually solve anything we've done in this module using an actual stack data structure. And we'll see a few examples of those in a few weeks.